Um, good afternoon. So last week you were testing the solubility of various organic compounds um, by trying to dissolve them in different uh, solvents, um, organic solvents, as well as um, acidic, basic, and neutral water. And you were using your knowledge of um, the structure of the compounds and uh, the polarity. Remember, it's like we were looking in lecture at the three-dimensional structure of compounds and identifying polar bonds. And from that, we concluded if uh, compounds have a net uh, dipole moment and are therefore polar. And um, you did the same with your solvents to sort of predict what the solubility should be. And you were following that uh, famous rule that uh, we all know about, um, like the sauce like, right? So this is what you found out last week, and uh, we're going to build on the same principle this week. Uh, but before we go into this, like, I want to sort of summarize what we learned last week. Um, you found what we say by like the sauce like, that uh, basically uh, polar compounds is soft polar um, or interact with polar uh, compounds and non-polar with non-polar. So, you know, this is just my summary. Um, what I was just saying, polar organic compounds can be dissolved in polar, uh, non-polar organic solvents. Um, polar organic compounds dissolve readily in polar organic solvents, but not enough, uh, they're not polar enough to be dissolved in um, an aqueous environment. This is where um, only small polar organic compounds can be uh, soluble in aqueous solvent. Uh, charge species, and this is what's going to come in uh, handy today. And then, of course, inorganic compounds, right? It's like uh, small salts like sodium chloride are readily uh, soluble in aqueous solvents. So we're going to build on this principle. Um, and not only today, but other labs as well. Uh, you're going to use the same solubility principles for crystallization, uh, which is upcoming. And then uh, later in the quarter, we're going to do column chromatography, uh, where you have basically a solid um, uh, materials like in a column and you load your mixture of compounds on top and then use the solubility of the solvent um, and the interaction to that solid phase to separate your compounds. And um, today or this week we're going to talk about um, extractions um, and more specifically liquid-liquid extractions. Um, so all of these workups, those techniques that we're learning, are useful for working out chemical reactions that you're going to be doing throughout the year, and um, um, that we're going to be doing throughout the year. And um, and you're basically just learning the techniques right now. Um, so for the liquid-liquid extractions, an extraction is really the separation of a mixture of compounds, and. As the word implies liquid-liquid, um, we're using different solvents to uh, differentiately uh, dissolve the compounds into one or the other. Right? So how we're going to start out is by uh, taking a mixture of compounds and um, we're going to dissolve those in a solvent. And um, then we're going to try to pull one specific compound at a time selectively in another comp uh, into another solvent. So this is where the extraction part comes in. So we're going to add another solvent to this and remove, hopefully, just one specific uh, compound from that mixture. Okay. Um, as I was saying, say for reaction workups, this is really important to purify your compounds or to maybe extract something out that you don't want in your reaction mixture. So since we're working um, on trying to uh, separate different compounds and we're using different solvents, if the solvents would mix with each other, that wouldn't be helpful, right? Um, and what do we call it when two liquids mix with each other? Anybody know? Missable. Missable, exactly. So this is not what we're going for. What we want are two solvents that are not, um, don't dissolve in each other, and we would call that immiscible. Okay, so it's basically just two ends in front. So this is what we're uh, shooting for. And there's many examples out there, it's like a lot of things that you guys are very familiar with is solid salad dressing, right? What do we have in there? We've got water or vinegar, and what else? Oil. Oil. 
Exactly. So the oil is the usually has long hydrocarbon chains, so it's very nonpolar. The water is highly polar, as we know, so they don't mix very well. And there's many examples out there. Um, we'll get back to this point in a second. There's many examples out there um, that won't mix with water. Here's just some common organic solvents that we use uh, for um, this kind of liquid liquid extraction. Diethyl ether, not soluble with water or admissible with water. Same with ethyl acetate, dichloromethane is another common one, and hexane. Um, one of the things you need to um, think about is when you have in your flask, if you have two liquids and they are admissible, you're going to form two layers. For our experiment, it's going to be important to keep track of which layer is the aqueous layer and which one is the organic layer. So that's where the knowing the densities comes in really handy. Um, water's density is about one uh, grams per milliliter. Most organic solvents are uh, less dense than water, so they're going to be on top. They're going to be the top layer. The only exception of chlorinated solvents, uh, such as chloroform and dichloromethane, they're more dense than water and they're going to be the bottom layer. So it's very important that you keep track of that. Um, especially later on, you're going to be switching solvents and you might extract with ether first, and then you extract later with uh, dichloromethane, and your layers are going to switch. So make sure you use those densities to always keep track of what's the upper and the lower layer. Um, and this. So, um, in the previous slide, the statement that I had on there, um, oops, right here, is that most organic compounds are soluble preferentially in organic solvents. And that is true. However, there's a few functional groups, uh, organic functional groups, that we can manipulate so they become more soluble in an aqueous environment. And I don't know if you guys remember, it's like from our um, a little bit of chemistry that we've learned so far for organic compounds, what do you think those compounds could be? Aldehydes? Not aldehydes. Um, acids? Carboxylic acids? Carboxylic acids and <laughs> amines, exactly. So you guys are going to be looking at a mixture of carboxylic acid, a neutral compound, and an amine compound, and we're going to manipulate those to separate all three of those. So we'll talk about the first two of the uh, components that are in your mixture first. Uh, one of them is going to be uh, uh, orthotoluic acid. So here's our benzene ring, carboxylic acid, and it also has a methyl group right here. Okay, And the neutral compound that is mixed in with this is 9-fluoramine. Uh, and this compound um, looks like this, has a ketone in it. And then on each side of that five-membered ring, we've got a benzene ring attached to it. Is that how you spell it? Yeah. Just to make sure. Line fluoride. Okay. So both of these compounds have a um, fair amount of nonpolar components. Like we got this nice aromatic ring right here, which is nonpolar with the methyl group, but we do have this carboxylic acid, which is slightly, slightly polar. And then this 9-fluoranone um, has mostly a nonpolar component, a little bit of a dichloromethane in the ketone. Both of these are going to be soluble in ether. Okay. And that is what you're going to dissolve those, uh, your mixture in, is in ether. So now we need to manipulate one of them to make them uh, more soluble in an aqueous environment. And one of the things we can do, since this is an acid, we can just do a straightforward acid-base extraction, or acid-base reaction. So we're going to take some sodium hydroxide, and we're going to uh, deprotonate that acidic um, proton and basically form a salt. So now we have a charged organic species. Organic compound. Okay, and this is going to be soluble in an aqueous environment. So 
So we just uh, decrease the solubility of this common compound in an organic solvent, but we increase the solubility in the in the aqueous environment. So and decrease solubility in the organic solvent. Okay, and this is the key part of why this experiment works. So instead of just adding some base to ether which wouldn't be very soluble, we're actually going to use um, like a one molar uh, solution of sodium hydroxide and we're going to mix it with the ether that this, these compounds are dissolved with. And from mixing the solvents, we're going to be able to transfer enough NUH um, and get the, uh, the, um, the toluic acid in contact with the sodium hydroxide and deprotonate that proton and make this uh, salt, this uh, carboxylate salt. Uh, so why don't we look at how the setup looks at this point. Um, so you will be using what we call a separatory funnel, which looks like this. Um, it has a stopcock on the bottom, and um, we can put a stopper on top. And this is a great funnel from the shape um, where you can easily see two layers. So um, what I uh, have prepared is actually sodium hydroxide solution. I put a little bit of dye in there so it's easier to see. And I brought some ether, so we'll just pretend that you dissolved your compound in the ether. And I should have brought a funnel and safety glasses, so don't do it without those. So we're going to put, we're just pretending that we have our mixture of chemicals in this ether. And before you pour, you always need to make sure that the stopcock is closed. If you happen to forget, you are going to place a beaker underneath to catch anything that will spill. So that's the easy um, thing to remember. So that's your safety card. So now I'm pouring my sodium hydroxide in there. And do you guys remember what we said from the densities? Is that going to be on top or going to be on the bottom? It should be on the bottom because the ether is less dense than the water. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> so that should go straight to the bottom. And it seems like it is. So I'm showing you a few things to take into consideration when you're doing this. I did have some videos up on the PowerPoint presentation, which is loaded up on Canvas. Um, get to it. So make sure you watch those. Um, the first uh, video gives you some nice basics on the technique and how you do it properly and everything. And then the second video uh, talks a little bit about some of the pitfalls, some of the confusion that can arise from uh, doing extractions. And we just don't have enough time to uh, go over all of those. So once you have your two layers in there, and I would not call them upper or lower layer. I would call them, um, this is our ether layer, this is the organic layer, the bottom is our aqueous layer. So always make sure you keep track of those and where your compound is. So to do the extraction, we will need to mix those. So the first thing you're going to do is place the stopper on there, invert, and then you're going to vent. So this is important. I, you probably didn't hear the hiss, but a lot of the organic uh, solvents are volatile, so they build up pressure if you shake them too much. So you want to release pressure. Make sure you also have your, um, your finger on the stopper so it doesn't slide out. And then you just want to gently rock back and forth a few times and maybe, especially at the beginning, vent to release the pressure. You're going to rock back and forth a few times. And then you vent. You might have heard that hiss. That was a little bit longer. Especially ether is so volatile, you really do want, want to vent quite a bit. So after you've rocked back and forth about 20 times, you're going to put your uh, subfunnel back in, remove the stopper. And it's always good to have a paper towel so you don't get your work area dirty or transfer uh, contaminants from the table into your flask. So now you're ready to um, separate your layers. What should have happened is that you have your organic compounds in here. The base should have now uh, interacted with the toluic acid and made the, um, made the carboxylate out of that and be transferred into this bottom layer here, the aqueous layer. So you want to separate those two layers. So you're going to drain the bottom layer into a flask that hopefully you labeled 
aqueous layer, and you're just going to open the stock cup and let this drain. And when you get close to the interface, you want to slow down and just drain carefully. Since we're trying to get um, compound out from the ether layer, it's okay to leave a tiny bit of aqueous in there because we're going to repeat this process a few times. Um, so it's okay if not every single drop uh, gets transferred. And you do want to make sure that you don't get any ether into the bottom layer. If that happens, you could always pour it back in and, and try your separation again. Um, if you have to recover the top layer, if that is the one you're interested in, then you would make sure that everything from the bottom layer gets transferred out, and then you would pour the top layer into your flask, and that's a uh, cleaner transfer. One of the things you need to watch out for um, when you, and we can just do another quick one. Uh, so this would be our second extraction here, adding some more sodium hydroxide. And again, you want to just put the stopper on and vent, and sometimes these are tricky. One thing you want to avoid is shaking really heavily, because that could lead to an emulsion. Now you just saw how much pressure I built up too. So um, that's something you want to avoid because, and the second video shows it very nicely. It's like how you can uh, get an emulsion. And this is really just a colloidal mixture of the two solvents that won't break up very easily. And there's various tricks that they talk about that you can use. So at some point you're gonna encounter that and need to be able to separate those two. A lot of times just rocking gently and waiting if you do get an emulsion is all you need. Uh, so that is the basic concept on how this works. One of the questions I do have for you is, um, do you think it's good to just do one extraction with a lot of uh, sodium hydroxide, or do you think it might be better to do uh, several smaller extractions? I would think it would be better to do several smaller extractions because you have more chance for the molecules to interface that way. And that is exactly right. Although you might think, like, hey, I'll just use a lot of solvent and then I can get uh, that all transferred. That is actually not true. Typically, you want to do about two to three extractions uh, with small amounts of solvent. So there's your book on page 116 and 170 has a nice calculation. Um, you can actually go through the math. And it's all based on the solubility of the compound in your organic layer versus um, the solubility of your compound in the aqueous layer. And this is, you get a constant basically. It's like it's called the partition co uh, coefficient. But I want, you, uh, I want to show the results uh, of that calculation. Um, if we start, let's say we have one gram of our organic acid in dissolved in 50 milliliters of ether. And we're just going to try to do three extractions with 15 milliliters each of the sodium hydroxide. So after the first extraction, let's say we can extract 60% of our compound. So what we get is 0.6 grams of the organic acid in our aqueous layer. And we get 0.4 grams uh, of the organic acid still remaining in the ether layer. Right? So when we do our second extraction, which I just did here, we should get another 60% from what's left over transferred into the sodium hydroxide. Right? So that gives us another 0.24 grams in the next batch of sodium hydroxide. And then uh, 0.16 grams remain. If we do it a third time, we get more of the sodium, uh, more of the organic acid into the sodium hydroxide layer. And very little actually remains at this point into, in the organic layer. Okay. We can combine all these three layers and we were able to extract pretty much 94% of what we had originally in the solution. So that is a pretty good recovery. If we did only one single extraction um, at a higher volume, um, we don't extract quite a bit. And we only get 82% of that organic acid transferred into the, um, into the aqueous phase. So that is not as good. Um, you will actually do an exercise on this for your pre-lab, and going through this calculation using a different example. Um, and you will see that the amount of volume you use does make a difference. Um, because here we're using 45 uh, milliliters of NEOH. Um, you know, in each one of these transfers, we only transfer 60%. Um, but 
overall is like we use the same amount of sodium hydroxide because we use a total of 45 milliliters here as well. Okay. Um, how are we doing on time? Sorry, I have to ask the questions. Like 20 how minutes. Time? How, how much? 10 minutes? 20 minutes. Oh, 20 minutes. Okay, so we'll end the lecture right here. Thank you. <laughs>